All right, folks, so we're about to begin here. Our first talk today on this track is going to be by John Grimm. Uh, John is the primary author of the Verizon Insider Threat Report. Uh, he has over 16 years of experience investigating data breaches, cybersecurity incidents within the government, and civilian uh, security sectors. John is also, uh, also manages a highly technical investigative response team. Uh, and they investigate data breaches and advises on containment, eradication, and remediation uh, for customers worldwide. So without further ado, uh, I'll let John kind of get set up here and we'll start the timer in a moment. Thank you, good morning Pittsburgh and friends of Pittsburgh. Can you hear me in the back? Is everybody good? Okay, let me uh, try speaking a little bit louder. Can you hear me now? Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, this year at B-Sides. I was here last year, had a lot of fun presenting last year on a topic, and this year was fortunate enough to be accepted uh, once again to come back here and speak to a wonderful Pittsburgh black and gold audience. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce myself. I come from a background uh, with the U.S. Army doing cyber counterintelligence. And I was able to move into the corporate world in 2009 and use those same skill sets to support our customers, our Verizon customers, external to us uh, in terms of data breaches. Most of the time I'm in React mode, uh, but for instance today I'm actually in, in a position where I'm in ProAct mode. So I, what I wanted to do is take this opportunity today to share with you some of the things that I've learned uh, out in the field, some of the things our team has collectively learned in the field, and highlight five specific different types of incidents that we've had, give you some direct countermeasures that you can use for mitigation and prevention, as well as detection and response. So I'm actually on a team called the VTRAC team. It's the Verizon Threat Research Advisory Center, formerly known as the RISC team. We have a global presence. We have teams in EMEA, teams in APAC, and, here, and teams here in this hemisphere in North America. We have the capability to do forensic investigations, everything from file analysis, memory forensics, endpoint forensics, network forensics, full packet captures, NetFlow analysis, recovering data from damaged devices, mobile device forensics, and we also have a cyber or threat intelligence element that we can bring to bear with our investigations. As uh, was indicated earlier, we. Uh, uh, I put together uh, with a team of, of our folks the Insider Threat Report, uh, also a data breach digest in years past, but more specifically today I wanted to hire, uh, highlight the data breach investigations report. How many folks are familiar with the DBIR in the audience? Okay, a good, good portion of the audience. Usually years ago when I would present the DBIR, uh, most folks didn't know about the DBIR. They only heard Verizon and heard Verizon Wireless or maybe Fios, but uh, it's been something that we've uh, been briefing, putting together for the 12th year now, our actual data set goes back to 2004. So within uh, our data set, you know, there's been uh, 86 different countries covered. This year we've had 73 different contributors. We're looking at just under 42,000 incidents and just over 2,000 data breaches. So when I use the term incident, please, that is anything including denial of service attacks, ransomware outbreaks, in, as well as data breaches. When I use the term data breach, just as a, as a, as a little note here, that is anything where a, a successful threat actor has actually exfiltrated data or compromised data from an environment. So one of the things here in setting up for uh, these five different incidents that we've seen in the past that I'll cover here in a second here, I wanted to kind of show, show you what we're dealing with when it comes to data breaches in terms of timelines. When it comes to the threat actor and them initially breaching the environment and exfiltrating data, it's happening pretty quickly. We're talking minutes and hours. However, when it comes to detecting and containing the data breach, detecting in particular, it may take months or even years. We've had cases where we found that the threat actor has actually been in the environment for several months and even a few years, okay? One of the things, too, I wanted to kind of show you is when we look at the data set, all 73 different contributors, and those contributors, 66 of them are beyond Verizon. They're law enforcement, they're CERT folks, 
There are other similar organizations to Verizon who do data breach investigations. When we look at those data sets and we look back in time, especially starting in 2014, and we do our analysis, we've seen consistently over the years nine different incident patterns, okay? Nine different patterns when it comes to cybersecurity incidents and the same nine patterns when it comes to data breaches, okay? And you can see on the slide up here, on the left-hand side is those nine incident patterns. On the right-hand side is those same nine incident patterns when it comes to data breaches. So what's going on here? Well, what we're seeing uh, in, in as compared to the previous DBAR in the year uh, prior to this, that insider and privilege misuse in terms of incidents has moved up to the number one type of incident pattern we're seeing, okay? We're also seeing web app attacks moving up the stack. When it comes to data breaches, as you can see over on the, the right-hand side, privilege misuse or insider and privilege misuse has moved from fifth to third. And we can see also that point of sale uh, environment has dropped down to the bottom of the stack. And then finally, we can also see that crimeware has moved up to the, the, the up, up to spaces on the stack. So what is this telling us? Well, this is telling us that the threat actors, especially with the PCI environment, are moving from the payment card skimmers and the point of sale terminals into card not present environments into the cloud, okay? We're seeing insider and privilege misuse becoming more and more prevalent, and I'm gonna show you a little bit more in terms of uh, insider statistics that we have. We're seeing the threat actors adjusting to where the data is moving to. We're seeing the threat actors uh, using different techniques to get to uh, what they're looking for, and I'll talk about motivations as well in a second. So in terms of the five patterns that I wanted to cover today, the first one is going to be web app attacks. The second is going to be the insider and privilege misuse. The third is going to be cyber espionage. The fourth is going to be crimeware. And the fifth is going to be point of sale. I felt those were the most interesting when it comes to data breaches. The other categories that are listed up there have to do with miscellaneous errors, have to do with lost uh, assets, and those really aren't as interesting because typically there's not really a malicious threat actor that's involved. So in terms of threat actors, when we first started looking at data sets, we looked at the threat actors and their access to the environment. And as you can see going back in time, this actually goes back to 2011. It actually goes uh, further back in time and it's pretty consistent. You see the external threat actors essentially three out of four in terms of the, the, the threat actors, about 75% of the time. Insider threat actors are about 25% of the time or one out of four times. And then there's a small, uh, amount of partner actors, which are kind of a combination between external and insider threat actors. As I mentioned a little bit ago, the insider threat has actually ticked up over the previous year, and you can see actually that the uh, insider threat is 34% of the threat actors that we're looking at. Another way to look at threat actors is their motivation, okay? And as you can see on this chart on the right-hand side, for 2011 on, financial is the number one threat motivator. And this is actually prior to 2011, we're just showing you 2011 on. The second motivation for threat actor, and by far a distant second, is espionage, okay? So for financial, we're talking PCI, we're talking fraud, anything where a threat actor can directly make a profit off of or make money off of or sell it and, and make money on the dark web, for example. For espionage, this is something where the threat actor is specifically targeting a, a certain uh, type of data. Maybe it's just a single file. Maybe it's for uh, an advantage when it comes to the corporate world. Uh, they're stealing somebody else's proprietary information. Or maybe it's nation state or state affiliated uh, when it comes to uh, stealing uh, secrets uh, from computer systems. And then the third motivation up there is kind of a catch-all. It's other. We also call it FIG. It's fear, ideology, grudge, as well as fun. So these are motivations, for example, hacktivism. It was really big back in 2012. You can see the little uptick there in the, in the green uh, for 2012. Uh, it could also be somebody who's an insider threat. Um, they've got a grudge against their employer, and that's their motivation. Maybe they're stealing data or they're destroying data. So the very first incident type or data breach type that I wanted to talk about is crimeware. 
So you're probably wondering, why aren't you calling this malware? Well, with those incident patterns that I uh, showed you previously, the nine patterns, if the data breach falls into one of those other patterns and it includes malware, that malware is associated with that pattern. So if it's a RAM scraper scraping PCI data, it's going to be under POS intrusion. Okay? So crimeware is kind of everything but malware that fits in those other categories. Probably the best example of crimeware is ransomware. Okay? Ransomware is malicious software. Uh, it's something that doesn't fit into the other patterns. It's actually something that can occur across all different industries. I'm going to show you some slides uh, specific to certain industries with some of these, uh, these uh, uh, incident patterns that I'm going to talk about. But just keep in mind, ransomware is indiscriminate. It can, it can target any industry. As you can see on the left-hand side, we've got ransomware second only to command and control crimeware. On the right-hand side, when it comes to data breaches, ransom ransomware is at the bottom. And that's because data is actually not being ex exfiltrated with ransomware. It's being encrypted in place, or typically not being exfiltrated. So when we look at our data set, we can see that ransomware is 24% of the crimeware, the malware. It's number two, as I mentioned, in the stack right there with the uh, incidents. If, you've, if you're familiar with crypto mining malware or crypto jacking, I, I do have some stats up here. It doesn't even make our top 10 list. It's 2% of the actual malware that we're seeing out there. We do see crypto jacking within our cases, um, but by far it's really not the most prevalent type of malware or crimeware that we're seeing. So this very first situation is ransomware or crypto malware. And this is a typical situation that we see with our cases. Um, you're probably wondering, well, what can forensics do when it comes to investigating ransomware? In the old days, there was a possibility we could do memory forensics and maybe find the key to decrypt the malware. Uh, modern uh, crypto malware or ransomware, that's not the case. So the threat actors have taken uh, countermeasures or steps to uh, prevent that from happening. We can come in and advise the customer on what they can do to react to a ransomware situation. We can forensically look at logs, look at, at systems, and determine patient zero or the initial infiltration vector. This particular situation involved key business critical apps being offline. It was impacting the victim organization's uh, daily operations. Their network shares with file extensions uh, had been changed and ransomware notes were found. So typically organizations re recognize a ransomware attack either seeing the pop-up ransomware notes and notifying their IT or IT security help desk or calling the IT and IT security help desk saying that they cannot access the files anymore. They've got these weird extensions and when they open up the files, it's all gobbledygook, okay? So both of these things were happening for this organization. So. In, in, in part of the incident response, the, the organization had backups, so they were reviewing those backups for availability and the time to restore. Files were being restored from the backups. Those files that hadn't been included in the backups were being uh, collected from individual uh, systems, right, for you know, those few days that were in between backup and actual use of the files, and apps were being reinstalled. However, the organization was still missing a chunk of their files, right? They were encrypted. Uh, the ransomware had already uh, taken place. So in doing the in investigation and coming in to, to assist with the response efforts, the network sh uh, shares, um, the files within those shares, uh, they were last modified by a certain network admin account. So that looked like that possibly could have been patient zero in terms of the user account. Um, so immediately, um, admin rights uh, for that uh, network admin account, or actually the entire account, was, was disabled. Logs were collected, and the laptop was forensically imaged. So it turns out in doing the investigation that that actual user account, that network admin account, had received uh, an attachment with ransomware. And the ransomware exploited, uh, in this particular case, an unpatched application uh, vulnerability. So the, the organization had found patient zero, the initial account. They were looking across their network for any other indicators of compromise and rolling uh, the incident down to um, getting back to uh, business as usual. They still didn't have access to certain files, so they considered paying the ransom. It was actually pretty inexpensive to pay it. Ultimately, in the end, they decided to do without those files, not pay the ransom because there was no guarantee that the actual key was actually going to be provided and would be able to uh, decrypt those files. 
So what were some of the key takeaways here for countermeasures? In terms of detection and response when it comes to these crypto malware situations, you want to block your access to any command and control servers that have been identified. You want to recall any known phishing emails from mailboxes. And that includes not just looking in the inbox, but looking to see if any users had potentially filed them in another folder, or if maybe they were scooped up by, um, by uh, as, as spam emails. So you want to completely eradicate those from anybody potentially clicking on them. You want to deploy uh, global policy objects to block executable files and disable macros. And you want to train and sensitize users to report phishing and suspicious system activity when it comes to mitigation and prevention. You want to keep host-based and enterprise antivirus solutions updated. And you want to patch your operating system and your third-party applications. And then finally, you want to also deploy a FIM situation in terms of mitigation and prevention and test and validate data backup processes to make sure that you can restore in a timely manner and that you've got as much coverage as possible with those files from the backups. So the next, uh, I should move this over here. It's kind of hard to see. The next uh, incident pattern I want to cover is web application attacks. So these uh, web application attacks are something that we see. Sometimes it's involving hacktivism where somebody's actually hacked a website, or maybe it's somebody that's actually exploiting SQL, using a SQL injection attack or doing something that involves those web applications. So when we look at the data set for the DBIR, we can see that uh, in terms of hacking action and uh, vectors and uh, varieties and breaches, the compromise of web-based email accounts using stolen credentials at 98% is rising, okay? So web-based web emails are considered a web app attack here, and you can see that on the left-hand side. And also, in combination, the use of stolen credentials. So this is really prevalent in the finance and insurance industry. Not only is denial of service and the use of uh, stolen credentials on bank banking applications very common, but the compromise of those email accounts become evident once those, once those attacks are filtered. So this particular situation is a web app attack with a careless worker. So the organization was looking to hire top talent and they were looking to go beyond just collecting resumes of folks that were interested in the job. So they went ahead and came up with this great idea to, to hack, uh, host a hackathon event, okay, to generate interest, to get really quality candidates applying. The problem was they came up with this at the last minute. They, they tasked their IT team to come up with a web application that folks could log into, a portal that they could upload their information, uh, fill out additional information on the page. So, this was an enormous success. The organization was able to identify all kinds of top candidates, right? And they were all excited and ready to, to send out notification uh, messages to those folks to, to pull them in for another round uh, of interviews. Unfortunately, while this was happening and they were reveling in their success, they noticed significant traffic accessing their web app server. There were several antivirus alerts that were being triggered. So, Initially, the organization was thinking, well, did one of these candidates, are they hacking us? Are they doing something um, with this web app? So the initial investigation determined that an attacker was exploiting a remote code exploit uh, web server vulnerability, and there was no web app firewall that was installed as well. So in the rush to put this hackathon uh, together, they didn't do proper code review. Um, they didn't put proper security protocols in place uh, to make sure it was secured. And what ended up happening is an outside entity, a threat actor, came in, leveraged web shells for remote, web shells for remote access prior to the AV alerts, and compromised the data that was uploaded by these candidates. So it turns out that the organization not only was set to notify candidates that they were accepted um, or potentially being accepted for the next round of interviews, but they were also having to notify the same candidates that their PII was compromised by this attacker. So this was a situation of a careless worker, somebody who didn't have the time and didn't spend the time to put security protocols in place and it led to a data breach. So we often see this a lot of times where there's an insider threat, somebody who's skirting IT security or cutting corners and it leads to an external entity coming in and breaching the organization. So some of the detection and response countermeasures 
assemble an incident specific incident response team, in this particular case, somebody who come in and handle web app attacks, engage a digital forensics firm to come in and do a deeper dive analysis into the evidence that's available, collect and preserve evidence and use evidence handling procedures because you never know if it may go to trial. There may be prosecution, the threat actor may be identified. Prepare public relations responses, especially with these types of events where um, external entity PII may have been compromised or even employees have been compromised in terms of their PII. You want to make sure that you have the proper response and you have that prepared ahead of time um, just in case you have to use it. If you already have templates created, it's just a matter of uh, taking those template, templates and modifying them to the particular incident at hand. In terms of mitigation prevention, follow secure software development lifecycle. Conduct your web app vulnerability scans and pen tests. Establish a patch management program. And use enterprise and host-based antivirus solutions, including in special situations like this hackathon event. And then finally, install web app firewalls, file integrity monitoring, and intrusion detection uh, solutions. And lastly, segment your network and your data. So this was a particular situation that was a great idea, but there wasn't proper planning put in place and there wasn't proper security put in place to prevent a disaster that occurred such as this. So the third type of incident that I want to talk about is point of sale intrusions. Now, point of sale intrusions are still happening out there. Chip and pin is still being implemented here in North America. It's been in Europe for a number of years. We do still see point of sale intrusions involving, involving the terminal. We do still see skimming, um, but what we're seeing more and more is the threat actors are moving to where it's easier to get to the data. Card not present in the cloud, e-commerce environments, okay? But I wanted to kind of show, highlight the point of sale intrusions because they still are something that we see quite common in terms of our data breach investigations. So as you can imagine, uh, accommodation and food services, and then I'll talk about retail are the two big industries uh, where this is a problem. So 100% of the point of sale breaches in this industry were discovered by external methods. So think about that. The victim organizations are not discovering it. It's somebody else that's telling them that they've been breached. And probably the best example of that is fraud detection or common point of purchase analysis where there's fraud uh, that's pointing back to a certain merchant, okay? And that's an indication that that merchant has been compromised. So the payment card uh, folks are contacting that customer and letting them know, hey, you need to have a forensic investigation. You need to have somebody who's QSA qualified to come in and do uh, an investigation of your network, okay? So that's one of the ways that uh, organizations are being notified. Another is a customer who's notifying the organization that, hey, I didn't make these charges on me, my credit card. Um, this wasn't me. You know, I think your website's been compromised. Or it might be law enforcement who's letting the customer know that, uh, hey, we've got an investigation going on. Your IP addresses or your, you know, something pointing to your organization is letting is indicating to us that they're part of a data breach that we're investigating. So you may uh, want to go ahead and have somebody come in and, and investigate. So for retail, uh, as I mentioned, point of sale compromise and gas pump skimmers continues to decline. It's because of the EMV implementation here in North America. The number of payment card web app compromises is close to exceeding the number of physical terminal compromises and payment card related breaches. So think about that. On the right hand side, you can see how this is, this is becoming the case where card not present is actually about to exceed point of sale hard present uh, breaches. So this particular situation is the point of sale intrusion, the faux pas. Um, this involved common point of purchase analysis, fraud analysis, uh, acquiring banks suspected a PCI breach of this particular victim organization. Millions and millions of dollars of fraudulent transactions that had occurred worldwide. Okay, so this is a big breach. So evidence included transaction flow. So when we come in and do the investigation, we're asking for whatever is available to give us insight in terms of the flow of the transactions, the, 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 if we can get a hold of the CPB analysis, any third-party access logs, 
point of sale system images, business unit systems, and third party servers were also in scope for this particular investigation. The problem with this situation was there was some counter forensics or anti forensics going on in terms of self inflicted ones where the organization had already started to react to the situation and forensic artifacts were actually lost. Systems were rebooted. And if you, if you do forensic investigations, you know that you're gonna lose a lot of volatile data that may not be recoverable when the system starts up again. You're gonna lose other artifacts that could be key to the system. So when we come in and we do these investigations, we wanna make sure we grab a memory dump and a live system image as soon as possible. Unfortunately, a lot of the systems had been uh, restarted. They had also uh, executed antivirus scans, which is great for response, but it also potentially changes uh, data in terms of forensic investigation analysis. In particular, it could be quarantining or deleting the malware. Um, it, it's also going to be changing timestamps of all the files that the AV touches. So in doing the response effort, you're actually kind of stepping on the crime scene. Uh, passwords were also changed. And there were also accounts that were deleted and logs were also deleted and or they weren't stopped from rolling over. Okay, so there was a lot of evidence that actually wasn't there anymore. However, the investigation found that the point of sale servers um, had unrestricted internet ingress. Okay, so that's, that's not a good thing. There was unknown remote logins. There was a backdoor rat, RAM scraping going on. There was a network sniffer and there were 100,000 clear text transaction log entries on a third party server. So there was plain text payment card information, there was various different types of malware, um, there were various different indications that the threat actors had been all over that environment. So recovery included rebuilding the systems, restricting the remote access uh, with source address filtering, um, requiring multi-factor authentication that wasn't in place for the remote logins, and reviewing the third party service provider service controls. Okay, so in terms of more specific countermeasures when it came to the de detection and response, this organization didn't have a specific IR playbook for their PCI environment. So when we do, do our assessments for incident response capabilities, more and more uh, common is not just to have an IR plan, but also to have run books or playbooks specific to specific incidents that you may have in your organization. So this this particular organization didn't have everything they needed at their fingertips to be able to respond to a PCI breach. Uh, also, uh, for detection responses, educate responders on effective and a timely response, right? Make sure that to the extent possible they're preserving data and not rebooting systems or overwriting logs. Conduct proactive network and endpoint threat based hunting or endpoint based threat hunting I should say exercises to detect undetected threats okay so instead of waiting for someone to contact you and let you know you've been breached go ahead and do threat hunting activities in your enterprise environment to see if the defenses that you have in place miss something okay we get uh, called in quite often to do retail health checks where we come in and we're looking for open uh, text or, or clear text uh, uh, payment card data we're looking for malware that hasn't been detected. We're looking for other indications that a data breach is ongoing. It's just that nobody knows about it. We review network and application logs. Uh, one of the things, that if you're a fan of the DBIR over the years, logs, logs, logs will tell you a lot, but you have to look at your logs, right? Um, they shouldn't be just there for the investigators. They should be there for the cybersecurity folks to look at at a periodic basis as part of your monitoring efforts. Define what's suspicious or anomalous and then look for it. Don't just have the logs there and nobody touch them. And also make sure you have logs because we do see situations where there aren't enough logs or the logs are rolling over. The breach has occurred a couple months prior and we only have you know three days worth of logs. For mitigation and prevention, implement system hardening baselines. Conduct vulnerability scans quarterly and pen test annually. One of the things that helps out in terms of forensics is getting a, a forensic image of the baseline. The baseline builds for the systems because then we can compare and contrast it with any of the suspected or the compromised systems to see uh, what the anomalies are, what the, uh, the, the, the differences are so we can narrow down to the malware as soon as possible. And implement multi-factor authentication for non-console system access for that remote access in particular. Use that second factor of authentication. And then finally, assess your third party. 
Don't forget about the third party and their access to your environment. Don't just cover down on, on your environment and your folks, but also make sure the third party is properly secured and following protocols to get that access to the environment. Okay, this next one is cyber espionage, this is the fourth one. So this one's, uh, this topic is very interesting to me. It's very hard to detect uh, cyber espionage. It's very hard to investigate it because the threat actors have a specific intent. They're looking at specific data and they're also looking at not being detected or even investigated. So they're gonna be covering their tracks and taking steps to make sure uh, that their tracks are as few as possible. So one of the industries that's really big with uh, cyber espionage is manufacturing. There's a lot of financially motivated breaches with uh, manufacturing, but espionage is still big. It's a strong motivator because that's where um, system designs are. That's where all of the, the secrets are as, as the manufacturers are developing new models uh, or new devices uh, for production. Most breaches involve phishing and stolen credentials, and most breaches with a web app as a vector also featured a mail server as an affected asset. So you can see here web applications and the stolen uh, credentials for manufacturing are at the top of the list. Public administration is also big with cyber espionage. It's rampant in the public sector. This is government, okay? State affiliated threat actors are targeting government secrets, classified information, sensitive information. And that accounts for 75% of all breaches in involving external actors. It's the uh, cyber espionage. There's been an uptick since last year, and you can see that at 168%. So this particular situation is uh, the inside agent. So we often see data breaches involving an, an insider threat where there's organization changes going on. And I have another situation to talk about uh, for the next uh, scenario, the next incident specific to the insider threat. This is also an insider threat, but this involves an external threat as well. So this organization was announcing unilateral pay cuts across the board. This included everybody, including the janitorial staff. So a threat actor that was monitoring the situation actually came up with, 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 with a, uh, an idea to get into the environment. It was using a physical means. So they identified a janitor, approached the janitor and said, hey, we'll offset your pay cut if you take this USB device and plug it into some systems in the middle of the night, nobody will know, nobody's around, and, uh, and we'll pay you for doing that. So the janitor agreed. So malware alerts soon went off in the environment, um, indicating that some external entity was actually uh, uh, touching these systems, okay? So the organization was like, what's going on here? They started looking through their domain logs for indicators of compromise, and several systems were being accessed by an administrator account. So they were befuddled, they didn't understand how the threat actors got into the environment. And it turns out, uh, as the investigation progressed and as we looked at the evidence sources, we did some temporal analysis comparison and we saw that as antivirus alerts were going off, right before that, USB devices were being uh, introduced into each of the systems. So there was a correlation there with time. So this switched from not just a logical breach, but also a physical security breach, okay? So by doing the timeline analysis, the time frame was in the middle of the night and there was very few people in the organization's uh, building. And so there was a short list of folks to interview. So it turns out the, um, the janitor went ahead and confessed to what, what he had done. Uh, he was promptly shown to the door and his employment was terminated. So this was a situation involving an insider threat, introducing a physical device in person to the environment and an external threat leveraging that access that that janitor had and that financial situation the janitor had to get logical access into the environment and cause a data breach. So what were some of the countermeasures? So in terms of mitigation and prevention, establish a host-based USB device uh, access and antivirus policy. So block those USB ports or if you're gonna have uh, USB access, uh, limit the number of devices that are accepted to be plugged in. Uh, and make sure your antivirus are scanning USB devices as well if you're gonna have that as part of your policy. Disable your USB device auto run functionality so that it's not auto running when you plug it into the system. And limit your local account admin usage. Now there's plenty of other countermeasures that can be put in place here, including, including physical security controls, uh, monitoring folks and all that. But essentially the biggest problem here was introducing the USB device to the system uh, by somebody who doesn't even have uh, logical access to the system. They only had physical access. 
Now this, I, I actually have two scenarios for this. I couldn't decide which one to include, so I do have enough time to cover both of them. So this is uh, insider and privilege misuse. Both of these scenarios were taken from an insider uh, threat report that we did earlier this year. And within that report, we highlighted five different types of insider threats, okay? One type of insider threat was disgruntled employees, right? They're causing damage or they're stealing data, okay? Another type of insider threat was the kind I just covered with uh, cyber espionage. Somebody who's stealing data on behalf of an external entity, all right? The third type that we've seen in our cases is insider threats who are stealing data for their own personal gain. Maybe they're going to a new company and they're taking customer lists with them or sensitive information that they can use in their new job. The fourth type of insider threat is uh, threat actors uh, who um, are actually, uh, actually threat actors who are causing damage to the organization because they're upset, okay? Those insider threats are, are insiders who are detected rather quickly because they're causing some kind of damage to data or assets. And then the fifth is a supply chain where it's either um, an external entity that has access to the environment or it's a piece of hardware that's been introduced to the environment and causes problems. So I'm gonna focus on two of those. In particular here, I wanted to point out for the healthcare industry, this is the only industry that we see within our data set compared to all the other ones where the insider threat is a bigger threat than the external threat. It's actually flip-flop with external threat. And when an internal actor is involved, 14 times more likely to be a medical professional, okay? It's no, not admin folks, it's a nurse or a doctor, okay? So either they've done something wrong by accident, okay, and compromise the system, or they're actually doing something they shouldn't. Probably a good example is maybe they're looking at somebody else's patient records. Uh, maybe it's an athlete and they're seeing uh, when that athlete's gonna be back on the field and they don't have a need to know that information. Denial of service attacks are infrequent, but ransomware is big for the uh, healthcare industry. I know we're talking insider threats, but it's big and you've probably seen uh, news accounts of different uh, healthcare organizations uh, being attacked by ransomware in the last year or so. So this is the disgruntled employee. So this also, uh, the situation also or, uh, was, uh, the circumstances involved in organization change. So a manager was disgruntled, um, wasn't sure he, uh, of his new role. He knew he was getting more responsibility and not any more pay. So he went ahead and decided he was gonna leave. So he used his admin access to take over accounts and download confidential files. At about the same time, a programmer reported an application on a server having unexpected failures, okay? Two separate incidents happening at the same time. The nexus was log entry uh, examination showed that the ma manager's account was logging into these servers before the problem started. So we have a connection between those two, two incidents. So the manager admitted uh, to accessing email boxes and collecting data for use in his new job. He was interviewed, okay? We were called in to do the investigation. At that point, our forensics confirmed that that ha had happened. But as with any case, you never know what else is, what's the rest of the story. So further analysis into the situation found that this disgruntled employee not only was looking to, to take this data that he had stolen, but he was leaving a nice little present behind for his employer um, in, in the form of logic bombs that were scheduled to go off at critical times throughout the year including the tax season. So after he was long gone, he was leaving a nice little present. So what are the countermeasures for this type of insider threat, the disgruntled employee? Maintain a need to know regarding restructuring moves. Only so, you know, make sure that the information you released is appropriate for the people that are receiving the information and uh, uh, that way you can, can keep rumors from floating and, and you can um, uh, keep, keep folks from not being disgruntled or paranoid in terms of their job. Implement an action plan to mitigate vindictive behavior by those affected. So what happens if you have an insider threat? Do you have a playbook or an action plan that tells you what you need to do next? Because with these types of situations, and a lot of times they don't involve malware, it's gonna involve uh, other folks. It's gonna involve human resources, likely. It's gonna likely involve legal counsel. It may even involve some other stakeholders, such as corporate communications. 
So make sure that they understand what their roles are, make sure everybody understands what each other's roles are, and have that in a run book. So you, if you have this insider threat type of situation, you know how to react. As part of the transition, conduct a thorough asset inventory. So as people are leaving the organization or moving around, inventory the assets that have been assigned to them. Make sure you collect all the assets as they leave the organization. If they have access to critical information or critical assets, hold those, those, put those on legal hold for a number of months or six months or however long uh, your policy says. Have those on hand uh, for investigation if an investigation is warranted after that employee leaves. Detection and response. Work closely, as I mentioned, with human resources and legal throughout the investigation. So this other, this bonus insider threat, this is the malicious insider. This is somebody that is an employee that has that trust and privilege and access to assets and, and data. In this particular situation, the victim organization had an employee who was using their smartphone to take uh, photographs in, works, in, in their workspace cubicle. So basically, they were bringing up their computer screen, taking pictures of the data that was on it. And this happened to be other customer financial data. They were then uploading uh, the data to the corporate cloud. Okay, so the in incident responders came in, started looking, called in the investigators we came in. The cloud drive and a review of that found hundreds of customer banking credential photos up there, and the timestamps actually went back weeks. And it turns out as the investigation progressed and surrounding employees in the cubicles were interviewed, uh, folks had heard the, the, the actual photographs being taken, right? But they didn't think anything of it. And they were working in a sensitive portion of the, of the organization, but nobody reported it, okay? During the exit briefing, the employee claimed that technically it wasn't a breach. The photos never left corporate systems. They were up in the cloud. So you would think that's all that can be done. Well, it turns out, looking outside of the enterprise environment, looking at other intelligence evidence sources, the clear web, uh, the dark web, the deep web, doing that research turned up a connection with this employee who had a boyfriend who um, had a criminal record, okay? And the criminal uh, history involved financial fraud, selling payment card skimmer data on the dark web, okay? So there was there a potential connection. Was this employee, was she going to go ahead and transfer this information to her boyfriend for sale on the dark web? In this particular situation, the rest of the story was told outside of the enterprise environment. So mitigation and prevention. So control and restrict data access through the principle of need to know trade secrets, customer data, and that sensitive proprietary information. For those uh, restricted areas, restrict uh, cameras and smartphones. Disable access to activity deemed inappropriate, malicious or otherwise posing a risk to the organization. And in terms of detection response, increase monitoring and logging of sensitive restricted areas, systems, and data. And then finally, monitor user behavior on systems to include external device usage. In this particular case, it was uh, uploading photos from a digital camera to the cloud. One last thing I wanted to kind of impart with uh, you from the DBIR is unbroken chains and path-based attacks. On the left-hand side, you can see the number of steps in terms of the number of steps per incident, and on the right-hand side is the number of steps in terms of the attack success. So what this is telling us when we look at the data set is most successful attacks are short, and it's likely because it's cheap for the threat actor, it's easier for the threat actor, and it's successful for the threat actor. So by applying these countermeasures that I mentioned today, you can go ahead and take steps to prevent these attacks from occurring, or at the very least mitigate these attacks, and force the threat actors to take more steps to get what they're after, whether it be financial uh, gain or whether it be espionage. The longer their attack steps and their attack string is, the more chances they're going to be detected and can be thwarted with their activities. So some takeaways, keep it clean, clean up human error, establish an asset security baseline around internet facing assets, keep data on a need to know basis, so only the staff that needs access to the systems 
to do their jobs should have that access. Be wary of inside jobs. Track insider behavior by monitoring and logging. Use two-factor authentication. This limits damage. It can be done with loss or stolen credentials. In fact, use a third factor if you can. Patch promptly both your operating system and your applications. This can guard against many attacks, includes ransomware. Maintain integrity, use a FIM system, uh, especially on payment sites. Encrypt your sensitive data. Be vigilant. Log files and change management systems can give early warning of a breach. They shouldn't be a tool that's used for investigators later on. Have your responders and your SOC folks uh, looking at those logs and monitoring for what's considered anomalous and suspicious. And then stay socially aware. I didn't mention this too much, but a lot of these data breaches that we see are preceded by a social engineer attack, whether it be phishing, spear phishing, credential harvesting, um, uh, website drive-by downloads, all of those kind of things are taking advantage of the human element and getting into uh, the environment through that human error or folks not paying attention to uh, emails that they receive and clicking on those hyperlinks. Finally, remember it takes a team. It's not just an IT security problem when it comes to data breaches. Over the years, I've seen data breaches more and more complex in terms of the threat actors and what they can do, but it's more and more complex in terms of stakeholders being involved. It's not just the technical folks, it's also HR, physical security, corporate communications, outside counsel, data loss pre prevention, and the list goes on and on. If you're interested in more data breach reporting, we do have a monthly intelligence briefing every month, the third Wednesday on Bright Talk. You can download the DBIR from the link above. You can just Google search Verizon DBIR. You can also download the Insider Threat Report. If you're interested in how we do the analysis for these breaches to build the DBIR, you can read about Verus in the Verizon Community Database online. And finally, if you have any specific questions to the DBIR itself, you can reach out to our DBIR team. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day.